You think of the smells that emanate from your body? Are there any that smell good? No. No. What an awful, horrible thing to start a message with. Well, let's pray and maybe get more serious. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and pray that as we open it this morning and look at it, that uh, your spirit would take these things and just build them into our inner man. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I got an email a week or so ago, and it talked about life-changing, something life-changing, and uh, change your life. And I looked at it, and I, you know, it seemed like a bunch of nonsense to me. And everyone's talking about life-changing stuff. You know, this could change your life, or that could change your life. Not all life-changing things are good, right? I mean, you could have something life-changing and be very devastating to you. Uh, for the believer in Christ, someone who understands, especially someone who understands sound doctrine from the Word of God rightly divided, is this not something that could change your life? I mean, for the better, for the good, for your benefit, here's something, here is something we, we have here, and, and with the understanding of the scriptures we have, here is something that could bring into your life comfort, stability, hope, you know, really have a positive impact on you, couldn't it? Didn't it? I mean, you ever think about the thought comes into my mind once in a while, where would I be if I had never trusted Christ? And I mean, I mean, who knows? It wouldn't have been good, I'm sure, right? There's an aspect of, well, having this understanding certainly gives you some uh, stability when it comes to knowing and understanding that when it comes to the circumstances of life, what happens in your life, a lot of bad things happen in the course of someone's lifetime, right? You, there's lots of things that go wrong. Every day things go wrong. I went to blow my nose, you know, an hour ago, and wow, that wasn't what I was planning for. <laughs> and, but the thing is that none of those things in any way uh, are an indication of God's favor or disfavor upon me. Wow! How many believers are out there thinking such things as that because someone's teaching it to them? Oh, what are you trying to tell me, God? Ah! And drive yourself nuts like that. <laughs> My message is about forgiveness. Understanding forgiveness is one of the things that can change your life for the better, I think. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, start at verse 12. I already have it open here. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. There's the verse right there, verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the whom? It's Christ, right? In Christ we have redemption. There's been lots of good messages this week, uh, great messages, and it, redemption has been talked about more than once, I think. Redemption has to do with paying the price to deliver someone for, from, from something, in whom we have redemption. In Christ, we have redemption. Christ paid the price, right? Christ, God, God had a price that had to be met. Christ went to the cross, he talks about through his blood, right? Christ paid that. He paid all of it. He didn't leave any of it unpaid. He paid the last cent in whom we have redemption through his blood. You think about, I've mentioned this from time to time back home, 
Think about Christ the night before the crucifixion and the agony that must have been, looking at, knowing exactly what, understanding perfectly what the next day meant, what he was facing the next day. You think about that, that's a really awesome thing. And yet he went, he did it. And he went to the cross, and God poured out on him on the cross his wrath for my sin, for your sin, and Christ paid for it. That issue was taken care of that day. And then he died, he was buried, he rose again. The fact he rose from the dead showed that he had the victory over that, right? Now, it says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. God forgives your sins when you trust Christ and that provision that Christ provided through his death, burial, and resurrection. God forgives your sins. Wow. Why do people, Christian people, why do they get messed up about this stuff? Why don't they believe what it says? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, Look at Colossians chapter 2. starting at verse 11, in whom also we, we are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. You know, I, I know that a man didn't do this, and you know why I know a man didn't do it? Because there's no hands involved. Everything people do, everything men do, involves hands, does it not? In whom we are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also we are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him. See, this is you being identified with Christ and all that Christ has accomplished. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, look at the end of the verse, having forgiven you all? Does that that mean everything? Having forgiven you all your trespasses. So you... I, who were formerly dead in sins, are made alive in Christ. And when that happens, part of the thing that happens when you put your faith in Christ is that all of your trespasses, all of your sins are forgiven by God. That doesn't include all of your sins, right? When Christ died on the cross, that was 2,000 years ago, how many of your sins were future? Oh, there's that word again, right? (laughs) Is God ever surprised by anything you do? I don't think he is. Are there any of your sins that Christ did not die for? He died for your sins, but there's that one thing, you know, it's just that nagging thing. Don't we all have nagging little problems, sins that come back and kind of haunt us? You know, you trusted Christ as your Savior when you were a young person, but there isn't, there's always that little problem thing that seems to show up once in a while. I mean, we all have those things. So he's forgiven you all of your sins. Why do you not believe that? Actually, you got something better than the forgiveness of your sins when you trusted Christ as your Savior, didn't you? Because you got something called justification. And that means that God imputed to you his own righteousness. I, I some time ago, decided that I was going to start using my Discover card, you know, to buy things, and then I would pay it off every month. So that's what I've been doing. And I did that because the Discover card has this deal where you get some cash back. And it also has this deal where, and I know I'm not going to win, but I have as good a chance as anybody. (laughs) If I use my Discover card to make a purchase, they enter me in this contest, and I could win $250,000. 
And when I buy gas, well, see, here I am giving a commercial for Discover Card. <laughs> when I use it for gas, I get 25 entries. Oh, I know, I think that's okay. But then that bill comes. So then I pay it off, and it goes back to zero. But, you know, that bill comes, and it's a funny thing. I think my billing date's like the third of the month. There's already more stuff on there. So forgiveness is just taking that and canceling out that debt. Justification is having imputed to your account more than you could ever use. Discover Card hasn't justified my account. <laughs> I could call them, you know, the customer service, but I'm thinking they wouldn't really listen. So I was thinking about this. We, we are justified, right? We have... We have Positive righteousness imputed to us. That's a great thing. I'm thinking that's a positional truth. You can't deny the truth of it if you believe what Paul says. But I think forgiveness, understanding forgiveness, is maybe a more practical aspect of that justification. Because forgiveness is something that we all deal with. We all need it. We all have experienced it from God and from other people. And, and, and it helps us to understand this maybe at a different level, perhaps. Now, turn back to chapter 1, verse 14 here. He says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, if you've read the Bible very much, you might have noticed this at some point. If you read the book of Ephesians... And the book of Colossians, you've noticed they're really parallel in many ways, right? You've noticed that? Uh, look at Ephesians chapter 1. There's a, a similar, this is the similar comparative passage in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, Start at verse 6, to the, praise of it, the, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood. That sounds a lot like the verse in Colossians, doesn't it? In whom we have redemption through His blood, uh, uh, the forgiveness of sins. And then he adds something here that isn't in Colossians. He says, according to the riches of His grace. Now... If you knew somebody who was rich and they gave you out of their riches, they could give you $5, right? If you knew Bill Gates and he was going to give you a gift and he was going to give you out of his riches, you could get, you know, 50 cents. But if he was going to give you out, give you according to his riches, would you be excited about that? <laughs> now, Grace is the most wonderful thing in the universe. It is, it's mind-blowing, it's mind-boggling that God, this holy, just God, would look down at someone like me and say something other than, let's get rid of that guy. <laughs> But instead, he looks in love, and he says, I'm going to send my son to die on the cross for that fellow's sins. And at a point in my life, I trusted Christ as my Savior, and I didn't understand any of this stuff that night when I did that, but God gave me, he, he extended to me his grace, and he forgave my sins, not, not according to, you know, doling it out. I don't have to go to somebody in a booth and, and list a list of sins and, and then pray a prayer a certain number of times to get forgiveness. You talk about just rank, oh. You know what? I wasn't raised in that religion either. And if you were, maybe you're more appalled by it than me even. We have the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. <laughs> That's a great thing. We are given, our sins are forgiven according to the riches of His grace. That means there is no limit to it. You know, we all know the verse, right? Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. We have God pouring out. There's more forgiveness than you will ever need in your lifetime 
If you lived a thousand lifetimes, there is more forgiveness because the grace of God is bigger than you, than the sin of all of mankind. I mentioned a moment ago about Christ and the night before his crucifixion and looking at what was awaiting him. And, you know, you, you take the totality of all of the sin of all of humanity over the course of history. You think about the, 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 the debt of that amount of sin. That is just more than you can imagine, isn't it? God has more grace. You, you think about the history of humanity, you know, from Cain and Abel on down, and the appalling atrocities and the horrific things that had been committed by human beings over the course of, you know, 5,000, however long human history is, and God in Jesus Christ took the debt of all of that and Christ bore that and you get the benefit of it. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Christ paid that debt and the gates of grace open wide and it is available in an unlimited amount for anybody who will avail themselves of it. And it is here right this close. And all you need to do is trust what somebody did for you and it will become available to you. Now, your sins are forgiven. And if you're going to quibble or you're going to fight or about, are they all forgiven? You're going to ask questions. Oh, God, did you forgive me? That is nonsense. You know people that do things like that? Christian, you assume they're Christian people. I guess they're saved. You know, ultimately only God knows. But understanding that you have this forgiveness from God, this is one of the most practical things that you could ever know. Because, and this should be something that affects your life in a positive way. Now look back in Colossians chapter 3. As we go through life... There are lots of people that we meet, and not everybody you meet is going to like you. Not everybody you meet you're going to get along with. You're going to meet people who are going to not like you, are going to do things against you, are going to oppose you, are going to, you know, they're going to talk about you, they're going to say things about you, they're going to cheat you, they're going to steal from you, they're going to betray you, they're going to do all kinds of things to you. Here's a verse about that. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, oh, see, there it is right there. If any man, have you ever been in a fight with somebody? You know, and when somebody does something to you, it's hard. You may have had, let, let me try to reshape this. You've had a relationship with somebody, it's been a fairly good relationship, and then they do something to you, say something to you, whatever, then that thing is like always there between you and that person. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes, sometimes over the course of time, if your relationship continues, that can like diminish so that it's not that big lump. But there are people probably, I know there's people in my life and there's probably people in your life that and you, you might see them and even be friendly to them, but that thing's always there. You know what I'm saying? Now, he says here, forgiving one or forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. You know what? If God could forgive you for what you did, you certainly can forgive somebody because God forgave you. Because, let me tell you, whatever they did against you, it was nothing compared to what God forgave you of. This is a hard thing to do. 
This is where grace becomes more than just a doctrine. This is where it becomes something that, that, that affects every part of you. Because you've got people in your life that you need to extend grace to, that you need to forgive, that you don't really want to. You would rather just, when you see him, go, wham! <laughs> there was, uh, I was driving through the town near us once, and there was, uh, I, you know, sometimes when people drive, they bug me. <laughs> and I'm driving down the road, and there's a car stopped in front of me on the road, and there's no reason for this to be done. And he's letting, there's no stop sign on the road I'm on or anything like that. And he's stopping to let somebody out of the McDonald's make a left turn. And I'm like, Wah! <laughs> And they look at the license plate and it was somebody from church. <laughs> oh, boy. That was hard to deal with, you know. <laughs> I needed to forgive that person. It, in the whole course, in the whole range, in the whole scope of things, that was a pretty minor thing, right? Sometimes people do much worse things than that. You need to be able to forgive them. You don't hold grudges. Don't harbor resentments. Don't be bitter. You need to forgive. You need to release you know, you've heard the expression forgive and forget and a lady at church came up to me after church one day and she says, well, what about this forgive and forget? You can't forget it. And, you know, that is true, isn't it? I mean, you can't. it's not like you can delete it from your mind like it never happened. But see, when you forgive somebody, it means that you have decided purposely, intentionally not to bring it up again. And if you haven't done that, you probably haven't really forgiven them. And what you need to do is to take the grace of God that he has extended to you and then extend it to that person, to that situation, to that incident in your life. Uh, the parallel passage to this in Ephesians is in Ephesians chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 32. Start at verse 30. He says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby we are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and all wrath and all anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. God forgave you. You need to extend forgiveness to others. Now, we call ourselves grace believers. Sometimes we shouldn't do that because we're not really very gracious. Grace believers, I mean, to really truly be a grace believer, you should, you should be the most kind, gentle, tender-hearted, compassionate person that anybody knows. Did I just describe you or not? <laughs> See, you're sitting there in the quietness of your own heart. You need to analyze that. And if you are not that person, then you need to change something by the grace of God. You need to do that. Now, I think I need to, at this point, show something about... Uh, I feel... Uh, compelled to remind you of the contrast between this issue in this dispensation with the body of Christ and the previous dispensation under the earthly ministry of Christ. And just look over quickly at Matthew, the book of Matthew. We'll start at Matthew chapter 6. There's a prayer in Matthew 6. It's a pretty famous prayer, right? <laughs> you know that prayer? Yeah. And he says in that prayer... Uh, verse 12, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's an interesting thing that of all of the points of that prayer, the thing that he expands on is that point in verse 14 and 15, where if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men your trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. 
Now, that's not grace, let me tell you. That's earning forgiveness by being by forgiving other people. And that actually is the opposite of what I'm talking about. But there's another passage in Matthew where he expounds on this even more, and it's in Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse 21. And here you've got this very interesting thing. And Peter, verse 21, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, Lord how oft shall I... Shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And he says, seven times? And I'm thinking Peter thought he was being really generous. That's what I'm thinking. And the Lord says to him in verse uh, 22, Jesus says, saith unto him, I say not unto thee, until seven times, but until 70 times seven. That's 490. You say, well, that's a lot. And yeah, it is. But you know, there's someone there keeping track. <laughs> All right? They've got a book. 469. <laughs> Uh-oh. That's really not grace either. That's not being forgiven according to the riches of his grace. Then he tells this story about a servant who owed his master, you know, like gobs of money. And the master, we're going to go through this quickly. The master calls the servant in to collect the debt. And the, 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 the servant doesn't have the money to pay the debt. And he begs and he cries and he pleads, oh, you know, yeah, forgive me, forgive me. And... The, the master is moved by the pleading of the servant, so he forgives the debt. Let's just say it was a million dollars, okay? So then that servant who had the debt forgiven, he goes to a fellow servant who owes him a nickel, and he wants to collect the nickel from the fellow servant, and the fellow servant doesn't have the nickel, and he pleads and begs and cries, Oh, please forgive me. And that servant who had the million-dollar debt forgiven, he says, Oh, no, no way. I'm not forgiving you this debt for a nickel. And he, you know, he throws him into the prison, and he says, You're going to pay this. Well, you know what? That was not a smart move. Because you know who finds out? The master finds out. Verse uh, 31. So when his fellow, his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and they came and told unto their Lord all these things. And then the Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. This is, <laughs> this is really scary stuff here. He says, I forgave you that debt. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors. That sounds to me a lot like he's going to hell. I'm not saying that's what it is, but man, it sounds like pretty serious stuff. He delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Verse 35. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if ye from your hearts... Wow. He's saying, you know, you, you ever say to somebody, oh, I forgive you, and you really didn't? He's saying, if you don't genuinely, from the depths of your soul, forgive that person, <laughs> that you're going to end up with the tormentors. So likewise shall my heavenly Father also do unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one your brother their trespasses. Let me tell you, that is not grace. That is a different system. That is not being forgiven according to the riches of his grace at all. Well, I just think it's important to see and contrast that. There, there is no way that that is grace or what's going on today. Now, that's forgiveness based on performance. I'm so happy. I'm so glad. I rejoice to know 
that my sins are forgiven, not based upon my willingness to forgive my brother who sinned against me. I am so happy for that, that my sins are forgiven based on the merits and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 2. This passage was touched on, and I want to just touch on it again, 2 Corinthians 2, 11, and you'll say, well, what are you bringing up this for in your message? And I'm going to explain that to you, okay? 2 Corinthians 2, 11, lest Satan lest Satan should get an advantage uh, of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So you, what do you say, what are you bringing that up for in the message about forgiveness? Well, here's the thing about this, okay? The, the Corinthians were a mess, right? And, and there was this guy at Corinth who was involved in this immoral situation with his father's wife or something in the first epistle. He says to put him out. Uh, to deliver him to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. That, that's a hard thing to understand. I think it means to be put out of the fellowship of the church, and I think that's probably what he means by it. So then they did that, evidently. The second epistle of the Corinthians, he's, he's addressing some of those things, and it, it would seem as if this passage here in the second epistle, chapter 2, is talking about that man that was put out of the church that he addressed in 1 Corinthians, I think it's in chapter 5. He says, in, and this is how this fits into this device of, this, the, the, of the devil. Verse 5, 2 Corinthians 2, 5. But if any cause grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is the punishment which was inflicted of many. I think he seems to be talking about that man who he said to deliver unto Satan for the destruction of his flesh. So evidently they put that man out of the fellowship of the assembly. And it seems here in this passage to be talking about that man. So evidently they, they, they did that thing. They put him out and, and he, he recognized his error and he adjusted himself and it seems as if he wanted to come back into the fellowship of the assembly so it says so that contrary wise you ought rather to forgive him now there's my subject you see he's paul's instructing them to take this man who was involved in this sinful situation who they had put out and he says to forgive him Uh, verse 6, sufficient to such a man is this punishment that was inflicted of many, so that contrary wise you ought rather to forgive him and to comfort him, lest perhaps one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. He's saying forgive him of that, lest he be overwhelmed by your lack of forgiveness. You see how this fits into what I'm talking about, this, this subject of my message, forgiveness. That, that, that not understanding forgiveness, not being forgiving, it can cause someone to be messed up. Now, there's forgiveness from God, there's forgiveness from other people, and there's also forgiveness of yourself, right? You need to come to grips with your own personal sin and recognize that God has done this for you. Because if you can't do that, you will never be a properly adjusted person as a Christian. It, you just won't be. So then he goes on and he says, verse 8, Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him, for to this end did I also write that, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgive it, for your, for your sakes for, forgave it, I in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. <clears throat> the devices of Satan, This I think the devices of Satan go beyond just this forgiveness issue but you see in the context here this is talking specifically about forgiveness and one of the devices well the devices of satan you know satan uh, there's words in this regard like crafty deceitful sleight of hand wiles right and it's all about uh subterfuge 
It's about people getting the attention off what's really the issue, focusing attention over here so that what's really happening isn't what should be happening. Now, this is interesting to me. Lest Satan should get an advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. It's very interesting to me. Uh, I, I did a series on this at church because I got to thinking, well, you know, I maybe don't really know what the devices of Satan are, and I, maybe I am ignorant of them, and, I, you know, I didn't want to be that way. And it's the word in verse 11, the word devices. Look at uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 5. You see in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, this verse was referred to once also, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. The word devices is the word thought. Bringing into captivity... Uh, every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's the same word. What I'm driving at here, a couple other verses uh, in this light. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. He says, But I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds, that's the word devices, in the chapter 2, verse 11. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. You know this verse, I'm sure. Start at verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds, that's the same word, through Christ Jesus. The devices of Satan are mind games. Mind games that are based or built on misplaced guilt and bad doctrine and anything that he can use to keep you away from, to keep you not focused on the, the truth of who you are in Christ. That's what the devices of Satan are. It's trickery, it, it's subterfuge, it's, it's just all kinds of bad thinking that goes on in your mind to take the focus off of who God has made you in Christ so that you can forgive people who have offended you and in any other way that could be done. It's not like in the movies, you know, how Satan is in the movies. It's like power and... Or I've never seen the movie uh, The Exorcist, but, you know, I've heard about it. And what a bunch of nonsense. It might be pretty scary, but it's just a bunch of junk. It's nothing. See, it's, he's taken the focus off of the reality of what's going on to get you focused on this stupid stuff. So you bring every thought into the obedience of Christ by cutting through the devices of the devil and focusing your thoughts on the good things it says in Philippians to think on these things, right? What's good and pure and all those things. You fill, you fill your mind with that and you'll be a better person. You'll be, have a better life. You'll be more happy. You'll be more... You know, having, for instance, unrealistic expectations of things, it will just ruin you. It's not proper thinking. Satan's all about that kind of thing. And... I'm going to close my message with this. There's a man uh, who was dealing, a man from our church who was dealing with this guy he met, who he says he's a Christian, and he, he brought this fellow to church 
three, four times. And this guy is really something else. You start telling him about forgiveness and all the things that we have because of Christ, and he would say, well, you don't know what I've done. What? His, it was like he was the worst person that ever existed on the face of the planet. And I'm thinking, boy, are you messed up. <laughs> you know, he's almost like he's a special case, he thinks. Brother Jordan mentioned that guy with the thoughts. It's kind of the same thing. And let me tell you this. You are not a special case. <laughs> you are not some special case. It's not like you were born and God said, Whoa! <laughs> Here's one I don't know what to do with. <laughs> now, I don't know most of you. I don't know what you think about what you say about yourself. Don't be like this fella that came to church a few times. That man is so buried under the devices of the devil. He, he, he goes, been to our church a few times. He goes to this church. He goes to that church. Man, you talk about wanting to get messed up. You just go around to a bunch of churches and that'll do it. <laughs> it is spiritual warfare. I, I don't know... I'm not saying it's not possible for this guy to get straightened out, but I'm just thinking he's not going to. And you know why? He doesn't want to. He likes wallowing in his muck and his mire. It somehow makes him feel good. That's messed up. He needs to grasp, he needs to acknowledge, he needs to wrap his mind, his brain around the fact that he's not some special case of person, that God could forgive him, that Christ died for all of his sins. I feel bad for him, actually. I wish he would stop that track he's on. We had another lady come through a while back. I, I don't know. Some people are just, I know from God's point of view, there are no special cases. <laughs> this lady was another one. I mean, she needed what we had to offer, and I could see it, but she just would not listen. You need to stop the talk that goes on in your head that's always negative and critical and self -con you know, self-condemnation, all that kind of stuff. You need to stop all that. That is not a benefit to you. You need, I said, there's forgiveness from God, there's the forgiveness of others, and there's the forgiveness of yourself. You need to acknowledge, yeah, okay, I did some things I shouldn't have done. There's always somebody worse than you. <laughs> And even they're not special cases. Christ died for that. If you are fighting that, well, maybe you aren't saved. I don't know. I hope this man is. I hope this lady is. You know, I, I did, I did basically, basically all I could do <laughs> is show them the truth. They have to get past that stuff. Grace seems too good to be true, doesn't it? Yeah. Grace, as I said, is the best thing going. God forgave you. If God for could forgive you, then you should be able to forgive others, and you should be able to forgive yourself. Acknowledge that stuff, and then God made you a member of the body of Christ and blessed you with all spiritual blessings the heavenly places in Christ, it is time for you to start thinking of yourself in that 
from that point of view, from that perspective. And it is only then that you will be thinking about yourself and other people in the way that is really good and right and beneficial for you. And dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your love for us. We thank you that you have forgiven us based upon your grace and not based upon our performance. We pray, Lord, that in our own lives that we would take that grace that you bestowed upon us and that we would bestow it upon others. We just pray this in Christ's name, amen.